Okay, guys, uh, for the next talk, something a bit different. So, we're lucky to have Mark here today. Mark Ryan is going to talk uh, about Shake, um, uh, Shake build system, uh, and also really stuff around that. So, a uh, big round of applause for Mark. Really good to be here. This is going to be a big change of pace um, from the last talk. Uh, I think I have one type signature in my slide <laughs> for me. So uh, I'm going to kind of try and walk through um, how you go about replacing your make files with a shape file. It's not always the right thing to do, but um, I've, I've really grown to like working with shape, and I think uh, there's a lot of advantages to it. And I hope to kind of walk you guys through it and kind of share some of the, the, the tens line shake, some of the, get some of the, um, the, the basic uh, primitives behind it, and then walk through a simple example that maybe some of us have run into uh, and see how shake can help us out. So I actually wrote this talk, uh, I wrote a talk before this one, this is my second talk. Uh, um, actually, there's a, there's a tweet came up that was um, about how people are talking about writing blogs about shake, um, and they should be using make. So kind of the whole point of this talk is going to be about how we should be using um, shape in place of make where there's a lot more power <coughs> to what we can do with it. So in fact, this is kind of going to guide my talk on what we can do with um, with, with shape. So first off, uh, this is what we're going to want to use make, right? Um, this is coming right out of the Hadrian paper about the, the um, downsides to using uh, make to compile Haskell or G the GAC um, compiler. There's, I think there's like three phases um, to, to, to compile the, the, to use, to do the compiler of the current make system. Uh, I have no idea what's going on here. Uh, there's lots of uh, dollar signs. Uh, there's a lot of indirection here. Um, whenever I get into make, I like find myself um, plateauing very quickly. Um, I um, I'm not a make expert. I find myself above my pay grade really quickly when it comes to make. And as soon as I'm on this page, where I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at like the manual for make, and I'm looking at these functions like filtering, sorting, words. It it, it gets it gets really challenging to to for me to kind of make this work. Um, and uh, I I don't want to spend this much time doing this kind of thing. So. Um, these are some Shake resources. Uh, before we like launch into what Shake is, uh, there's um, uh, this is the main paper that Neil Mitchell wrote about introducing Shake, uh, Shake before building. Uh, he put out a great manual. It's really easy to follow. There's some great examples in there. Um, they've been working on a paper that's coming out recent. That's going to come out soon called Build Systems a la Carte, and they kind of walk through um, both Shake, uh, Babel, Make. Um, and mix as well, and bring some other kind of approaches to, um, to make. And then there's paper non recursive make considered harmful. Um, that's kind of the, the impetus behind moving GHC off of, um, off of make and onto shake. And then there's shake on package, which has a lot of good documentation. Uh, so, so, why shake? Uh, well, the first thing about shake is that it allows your dependency to be specified at, at, at build time. Uh, there's kind of a, a connotation here of you get monadic dependencies or supplicative dependencies. Uh, you can do something, and then you can depend on it. Um, so there's no static dependency graph. Where, whereas in a regular make file, there, there are ways around this, but it, it's not very pretty. But you, you pretty much get what you put down in the make file. You have to be constantly either generating the make file or constructing it or, or, or being limited by what you can put in it. Um, whereas Shake gives us all these abilities to uh, be dynamic, and, and, and make kind of newer kind of dependencies that we wouldn't be able to express inside uh, a regular make file. And it also gives us uh, finer grain dependencies. Uh, we can do a lot more things here. Um, we can kind of walk through these in the next couple slides. So um, there's all kinds of things you can take dependencies on in a shape file. You can take them on in the value of an environment variable, um, the a file contents, uh, directory contents, um, all the, or, or you can even define your own dependencies, and this is this is really powerful. This is really expressive. Like we can do a lot of things that would just like have to pull our hair out if we were trying to work in Make with um, with these kind of things. Um, 
Uh, and then there's some, some extensions here that are, are really useful, um, um, where we can generate dependencies with multiple outputs, um, not just a single file. We can generate multiple files or multiple targets. Um, we can also have resource cards. So if we have some resource that we want to limit um, throughout the make process or build process, uh, we, can, we can wrap it in a guard and keep things from, from access, multiple processes from ac um, accessing the resource. Um, and it's all stuff we can do outside of in, in, with a make file, but in shape, it just gives us a lot of these primitives up front and gives us a lot of expressivity um, and allows us to do our job a lot easier. Um, and finally, like the host language is Haskell, like, so hooray, like, but uh, I don't have to write make, this make crappy make DSL that I can't like, just a bunch of string processing. I have types and I have, uh, not that I'm going to use them, but, uh, oh, I am going to use them, but I'm not going to write signatures for them, but I, I get to like get the full power of Haskell inside a build system. So that means I get functions, I get modules, and I get packages. Uh, so like, I can have a library of shake um, commands and shape recipes, uh, and I can do that and share that with other people, and I can start to build larger build systems and start to use modularity that we get in Haskell that is nowhere inside of a make file, uh, and it's, it's very hard to, to, to get at. So this allows us to have like a lot higher levels of abstract abstractions, and we get a lot of reusability. Um, I can get started with a with a uh, with like a common library for shape uh, and get. Uh, projects up to going with like, a, like very little effort. And I don't have to do all this copy pasta to, to get my make file in shape um, for a new project. Um, and then there's a lot behind uh, the, the move to JC. They talk a lot about how um, they used to have to have lots of build phases. Um, they used to have to generate make files. Um, there was phase one, phase two, phase three. Each one of those phases is a, is a, a is a unit of concurrency so, and dependency checking, so that there's a lot of restrictions when you have to do multiple phases. And those kind of all go away with shape, which is super exciting. Um, so I'm just going to quickly walk through what shape is. Um, it's a very high level. I'm going to capture just a, a very um, top level view of what shape is, um, and. And essentially, it's a, it's a set of rules, just like any make file. It's a set of rules to build targets. Um, uh, so our rules are our top levels, but in the difference with shake compared to make is that our targets are composed of these actions. And these actions are monads that are able to track dependencies, um, and, as well as like uh, generate new dependencies through their actions. Um, so these actions are going to help us build the targets. But they're also going to let us like do new new cool and different things. Um, we, have, we, we capture our dependencies through wants and needs. Um, so we call, like there's the primitive, maybe two primitives are want and need. Um, so we, we, if we need a target, we, we need it. Um, and then the two, prim two primary rules I'm gonna use is uh, this, this operator for um, a file pattern matching rule that's gonna let me generate files um, based on a, a pattern match. And then there's a funny rule, which is just basically always run the rule um, don't no no associated file with the with the rule. Okay, so now I wanted to use Shake. Uh, so that was kind of like a quick introduction to Shake. Um, I wanted to to kind of talk about a problem that I we have and I've seen a, a lot of on on various forums. Um, if does anyone know what this looks like, like this is like a long compile time, right? This is you're building all your dependencies. Um, we, um, at, at, at my company, we run containers where we're conti continuously trying to process like uh, various um, projects that have in sync dependencies, right? Like hundreds of dependencies. Uh, constantly, if, if we're not careful with the way we compose our containers, we end up having to um, continuously like evaluate these, uh, these, these long build times to, to pre-build our, our, our dependencies. So what we're trying to do with this, um, the problem we're trying to solve is that we have long dependencies times in Docker containers. We have lots of projects, lots of common dependencies, um, and we're doing these like per project optimizations that are unwieldy and like super error prone uh, and like hard to follow. Um, so the, the solution we're trying to come up with here 
is we're going to build, uh, so Docker has, you know, in the last year has introduced this concept of multi-stage um, containers. Um, what that essentially is, is you can build like a, a build container and then have it uh, decoupled from your runtime container. So you, you, can, you can set up a huge build container that just has like the entire kitchen sink in it. Uh, you can build with it and then pull out your, your, um, your executables and move them into like a much smaller and slimmer container. Um, so, the, what we're going to try and do with this um, with this project I'm going to walk walk through is we're going to try and get all the project dependencies we have across our company. So I'm going to represent this by two uh, repos, but I want to like go through collect everything every single uh, the external dependency they have. I want to merge those dependencies, and then I want to like uh, set up like a, a container that has all those dependencies um, built for it. And just kind of like a walkthrough of using, of using shit. So uh, this, the code is all sitting in GitHub um, at that location. If anyone wants to follow um, along, uh, it's structured so that you can you can like walk through. I, I've structured it as a series of pull requests. Um, and if you want to walk through and, and see how we kind of develop this process um, iteratively, I, I can't live code, so I'm not even gonna try. Um, but I'm gonna try and like walk through each one of these. Um, these approaches to, to introducing shape. Um, okay. So uh, what I have here is um, this is like this is the standard. Make the font bigger. Make the font bigger. Is that good? You can make that back. Turn it to eleven. Um, so I have two files here. This is the this is like what's changing. This is like what the file looks like. Um, uh, and so this is like my, my this is like my boilerplate for shake. Um, this is an executable file. I'm using stack here. Um, I'm bringing in basic prelude um, and the shake package. Uh, and I'm I'm setting up. There's my type signature. Uh, I'm setting up um, shake with defaults um, with like one particular exception. Um, I'm going to use the contents of this file to drive a version for um, Shake, so that any time I, I change this file, I'll force a rebuild of all my rules. Um, but I make this file executable. I sit, I park it in my home directory, and then I just I start um, I start compiling or running it. Uh, and I'll run it with verbose just so we can see what the output says. Um, and so I, I've said like. I want to gather, so I'm kind of going to do an exercise in backwards, programming backwards. I'm going to say that, like, I want dependencies. I want everything, um, all my dependencies from my projects. Um, and if, I, if I look in this um, projects directory, I have a couple of projects here. Um, there, there are a couple of projects we have at work. Um, and I'm going to go, I want to go through, they have some big dependencies, like Amazonica is part of the Wolf package. Um, Warp has uh, Warp plus others. So, there's going to be some dependencies here that we're going to want to kind of capture and then kind of uh, merge and unify. And I want to do that using using shape. So the first thing I ask for is for the dependencies. And shape tells me uh, I can't find that file. So yeah, sure, I, I don't have a file yet. So we gotta, we're going to start walking backwards and saying, like, what do we need to get um, this file? Um, so if I look at the, so what I've done is I've gone ahead, I've gone ahead and added um, a rule for dependencies. So I still, I still wanting my dependencies, and I've set up a, a rule. So we saw this before with the operator. Um, that is a file pattern match. And so what I'm saying is dependencies is going to give me my out file. That's the dependencies file. Um, and I want to produce this file by the end of this, um, this rule. Uh, and again, it's all wishful thinking. I'm going to go look at this projects directory. And I'm going to go get a list of the projects that I have there. 
That is going to create a dependency tracking inside of Shake so that anytime the contents of projects changes, I'm going to re have to rerun this rule, which is really exciting because that would be really hard to do in Make. Like, I don't even know how I do that. Um, but this is, this is letting me kind of use dynamic um, um, dependencies to, to kind of draw, to drive my project. And so um, this is kind of hard to see, but what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, um, I'm adding, I'm, I'm going ahead and taking my dependencies. So it's going to, it's going to list me like the projects that are, that are here. And I'm going to, the way I, I like to work with Shake is every step I like to create a file, even though Shake doesn't make that a, a, a requirement. I like to make a, a, a file to keep track of what's going on and to kind of walk me through the process so that it makes for easy um, troubleshooting and figuring out like where I am in this process. So it ends up being like a bit of a pipeline where I'm like linking these files together and looking at their contents and seeing like if I'm going in the right direction. So I, 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 create, I kind of like map through all these values, I kind of add an extension to them, and I say I need them. Um, and then I'm going to like operate on them once I'm done with them. I'm going to say like I'm going to say like I've gotten the contents of these files, um, and I'm going to run them through a simple unique sort where I say like merge the files and just give me the ones that are um, are, are 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 unique to both to both sets. So if I go ahead and run this. Um, Shake is again going to complain. It's going to, it's going to say wolf.dependencies. I have no idea about this because I have no rule for wolf dependencies yet. Um, so I go, it's the next stage in the, in the process. So this is a pretty simple rule. Um, Stack comes with a uh, with a with a helpful um, this I'm looking for I'm looking for wildcard.dependencies, so I'm looking for anything with a dependencies extension. Um, and I get I get I'm gonna run a simple command here. Um, and stack comes with this um, this uh, command called list dependencies. Um, I'm going to use this command to list all the, uh, the dependencies of the project. I'm going to ask for just external ones, and I'm going to—I don't want to know anything about the ones that are coming come with the base. Um, so I'm trying to like, find the like, external uh, dependencies of this project, um, and then I'm going to write it out to the, the file, whatever file like I was given here. Um, and so Shake comes with these nice um, commands. Um, you can you give the command a run. You tell it like uh, where the standard out should go. Um, in this case, I'm pointing this. In both cases, I'm pointing standard out at the file that was given as a dependency, uh, and then I'm running my command. Um, so once I run these, I actually had success, right? Uh, no complaints. So if I, if I go and look at these files. Like, hooray! Like, here's here's like the, the all the dependencies I depend on. Um, there's a lot of them. Uh, there's 128 for that one. Um, for the other one, there's 100. But the problem is, uh, as we're working through this example, is that I have all of these versions that are associated with the dependencies, and what I want to do is actually come up with a version-free set of dependencies, like. I want just to, to know what I depend on. I don't know which. I don't, I don't care which versions I depend on, um, particularly. Um, so the next step in our um, process is that we're going to strip out those versions. Uh, and so what, how we're going to do that is. Is that instead of taking a dependency on um, dependency, just uh, an extension of uh, just dependencies, we're going to add a versionless dependencies dot versionless. So we're going to like introduce a step here between the dependencies we had 
And by, by coming up with like a new, using a name, uh, we're going to come up with like a new um, kind of file. And we're going to have a new operation and a new rule down here where we work on um, versionless dependencies. Um, so uh, this is pretty simple. This, this is going to link to the rule above it by, by just doing a need on the file and dropping the extension. So that's going to whack the version list off. That's going to put us back into a dependencies file. That's going to, we're going to get the dependencies there. And then we're just going to take that file and we're going to strip off the version so that we can have uh, the same set of uh, dependencies just without any versions on it. Um, and so if we go ahead and look now at our dependencies, they still have versions on them, but if we look at these versionless ones, it's awesome. Like, we're all set now. Um, and we've gotten to a point now where we have a dependencies file that is, um, has no versions and has like the, is like the merged value of all of our dependencies. So this is exactly what we wanted. Um, and we can see that uh, there's 142 dependencies. And if I look at the other two, there's um, there's 100 in, in the one package, and there's 128 in the other, and that we we have a commonality of 142 dependencies between them. So this is it. we're exactly in the position we we want to be in, where we have everything we know we depend on across our entire organization. In this case, it's just two projects, but you can like blow this out to a lot more um, um, repos or projects that you work with, and we can take this and we can start to work on our Docker file that's going to be like huge. Um, so uh, the next step is to take those dependencies and build a Docker file with them. Um, so we're going to change our Um, we're going to go ahead and change what the, the thing we want now. We, we no longer want our dependencies. We've got that file ready. What we really wanted was our Docker file. Um, this is what we were after all along. Um, and, and so we now need a recipe for the Docker file. Um, and so one of the things we've done here is We've added. We've used this feature in in uh, Shape where we can read contents from files. So we could do, have done this with an environment variable. We could have done this maybe some other mechanism with some configuration. But what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to look at these two files we we um, set up. Um, can kind of look at them up here. They're going to tell us like what our uh, what our our base container is going to be, and then what kind of resolver we're going to use. Um, we're going to read those out of. Um, those files. Anytime we change those files, anytime we like change the resolver, change the base image, this rule is going to refire because um, this this refile has a dependency tracking on it that's going to let us track that dependency as it changes. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go get our dependencies file. So we generated it. This is our like our first goal. Now that we have it, we're going to like go read it in. Um, that's going to force it to get rebuilt if it needs to be. Um, but then we're going to be able to like now work with our dependencies file, and we're going to build our Docker file down here. Um, and this is just straightforward. We're going to build a, a from stanza and a run stanza that is going to take. Um, it's going to build all these um, these dependencies, and it's going to generate this file um, inside our inside our uh, inside our project. So when we look at our, our generated file, we have this you know crazy big ass Docker file. Like this thing is going to take like hours to build. Um, it's going to you know be like maybe two gigs, three gigs, four gigs. But it doesn't matter, right? Like we're just going to build with this thing, and then we're going to throw it away. But this is exactly what we wanted. It's going to like speed up our builds a lot because we basically have the kitchen sink um, and it. To build with, and we can like find all of our dependencies really quickly, um, and it's going to work for all of our projects. The more we add projects, we can put more projects into this um, directory, 
and we can get more dependencies brought in than need to get brought in. So, like this is great. Like this is what we were targeting. Uh, the, the the downside is though is that these projects change, right? Um, so they're they're brought in as submodules now, um, but they're 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 Git projects and they change as well. So one of the things like we want to do, hopefully this kind of highlights the power of Shake is we want to start. Um, oh, I'll just do one one quick thing. One once now that we have our dependencies in place. We get another um, a cool application here is that we can not only cache our Docker file, but we can cache our, our build dependencies locally by setting up um, a build rule that says, okay, give me that same resolver, give me the same dependencies, and then now build all of these locally. So this is going to serve as like a kind of like a, a cache um, to say like if I come up to this machine and it's like brand new, I haven't built anything. I'm going to go ahead and like build everything that I, I know about every single one of these dependencies. So that now my like local um, um, desktop is all warmed up, and I can like start building other things really quickly. Um, and it kind of takes care of that problem. Um, but I, I alluded to before, like the um, our repos might start to change. So there's. A rule that we like to do that we like to we like to start talking about um, keeping the repos up to date, and so we we want to start talking about if the local version of the repo is not um, in sync with the with the remote version, then we want to go sync it up, um, and this is where like it starts to get really powerful with Shake, and that we can um, run. Like arbitrary commands and and do like um, you know arbitrary like like uh, dependencies on things like Git versions, which you know again really hard to do with a make file. So what we're doing right here is we're saying uh, I go go give me the local version of this project, give me the remote version of the project. If they're not if they're not equal, then run a, a hard reset on the local file and then write out the the remote version. Um, and so, you know, if I go back to, to trying to run this this function, I'm gonna we're back to our previous state where um, these files are 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 around. It's like there's no such thing as wolf.local. So now we need rules to generate these files um, again. So. So we're going to set up a couple of rules for our, both our local and our remote recipes. Um, the local ones is super easy. We're going to go to the we're going to go to the um, to the repo. We're going to read out the the, the version. The, the remote one's a little bit different. We're going to fetch first, and then we're going to read it out. So pretty straightforward. Um, and and once we have these. Um, We should have like the remote versions, the local versions um, present um, down here, uh, and then we now have we now are keeping our projects in sync with with what's going on in the server. So our make file is now depending on the contents of the server um, or the contents of our Git repo, which is which is great. Like you can't fall behind. This project is going to like only run rules when it needs to. That's great. The the one downside to this is that if the, the server changes, we haven't captured the fact that we need to always run this rule. Like this rule doesn't say uh, we, you know, we generate a file, but once it generates the file, it's set. So we, Shake gives us this, um, this function that lets us uh, force the file, the recipe, to always run. So it's a simple little always. Rerun. So what we're going to do with this uh, this recipe is add that in, and then every time we run this this rule or trying to build these files, we're going to see that the 
file is always going to get, and it's always going to check for the version. So no matter what we do, we're always like keeping in sync, and and Shake is keeping track of the dependency and only forcing the rest of the uh, rules to rebuild if the version on the server changes. Cool. So I have a couple other rules. Um, there's some there's some other things that Shake helps you out with, but this is kind of the main gist of you know getting started with Shake, doing something cool with it um, and complicated. Like to do any of this in Make, I mean I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even want to think about what I'd have to do. Um, this is all Haskell. It's really easy to write um, and, and play around with. Um, and Shake gives us a lot of like tooling to help out and, and kind of build build these up, build these out and, and kind of learn from it. And then um, you know, get a much more expressive and powerful uh, build system than what we get with Make. And you know, get, get like do things you couldn't even imagine doing. Um, and so th this is pretty like, you know, easy, like PZ, like kind of like approach to a problem, but there's a lot of other great things you can do um, with Shake to, to kind of solve some problems. So, so I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, I encourage you, if, if you want to follow through the slides, check it out. It's uh, it's, it's easy to get started with. I, I, I had a hard time getting started with Shake, but since we started using it, I kind of use it everywhere. I have these Shake files, like literally in every project, drive some people crazy. Uh, but I, I find it's just like if I have to do anything remotely interesting with a make file, I like want to have a shape file there uh, to help me out. So, that's all I got. Thank you. Can you compare and contrast with Nix at all? Yeah, that's a great question. So we use Nix a lot too, um, and I, I love using Nix. Um, so Nix is like going to give you a very static specification of what your project is going to be, um, and you're able to specify every single dependency and of uh, all of your packages and projects. Um, and it's great; like works really well. Like you build it once, you don't have any rebuilds, but you don't get the kind of control you get here in the dyna dynamicism of being able to like have dependencies on. You know, environment variables, file contents, um, a lot of that you don't need for, for Nix. But, um, you know, yeah, if I, was really, if I really wanted to build a container, like, you know, in a, in a very static way, I would, I would definitely use Nix. Um, but given that we're, trying, we're, we're using stack and we're doing, like, you know, we're doing a, we're doing a build all, like, and actually laying out every single one of the, our dependencies in Nix is like, there's 140 dependencies, it kind of gets tedious to, like, Keep track of all the different um, Nix recipes or uh, you know, der derivations for that. Um, you kind of stuck with this because it's like a little bit less lifting. But I think there's a, like a future with like content hashes and build so, systems. And so you use Nix for certain things and, and you use uh, Jake for certain other things. Yes, it's not they're not like complementary in any way. They're just we, we don't use them together now. We don't have them together. Sure. Any other questions for Mark or anything on talk or shake? I was going to ask David. Shake is really cool, partly because you get a full, the full monadic story rather than uh, just applicative dependency. I was wondering if there was any kind of parallel builds coming from do you or anything like that? Is, there, is it useful to notice applicative when you can get away with it? Yeah, that's a good question. Man. For applicative do and, and kind of paralyzing a lot of like operations, uh, that, that's a great question. I, I don't know if there's like the integration with that, but that would even paralyze and speed up things even more. Um, as it is, you know, you can express a lot more concurrency here than you could in a lot of other environments. Um, and, and being able to like take advantage of an applicative over a monad situation is even it would be so I think there's actually some stuff on this in the paper you mentioned at the beginning, the build systems a la carte, um, which is a fantastic paper I really recommend, where they compare different build systems and Neil and Neil will try and kind of decompose to what the main elements are. And they actually, I think they touch on that of, the, in a sense, that's one of the potential weaknesses of um, uh, of shape, particularly when it comes to caching, you look at things like Nix and such, where you really need to do all this parallel stuff and cache everything. Um, and they do talk a bit at the end about how 
they kind of propose some changes they want to make to shake to cover all that. I can't remember in detail what it is, um, but anyone who's interested in this, I really recommend that paper. Yeah, it's a great paper, right? They come up with like a kernel to describe the basics of how you build any new system, right? And then how you would recompose the next thing uh, based on the kernel. And so it's a really good paper. Any last questions? <clears throat> All right, thank you again, Mark.